I started doing research on Sister Nivedita because of a novel that I'm writing. And, uh, and when I found out about Sister Nivedita, I got so uh, interested that I started doing more because I couldn't believe uh, this woman, you know. I couldn't believe what she did and how she uh, influenced so many people, uh, including our Sri Aurobindo. And uh, what, what I decided to do was just... Uh, just get together a few slides. Now, what, what you're going to see here, I, there's about six or eight slides. So you, you can see those people there. And the, the amazing thing is, uh, I'll, I'll start with uh, Sister Nivedita. She is an Irish woman, and she was born uh, in a family of Protestants in Ireland, because a lot of the Irish, you know, are Catholics. So her father was a minister, and he, uh, he took great pride in his daughter being somebody quite special. So she got a lot of uh, incredible education, and she also felt that she could change the world. She had a, maybe a slightly messianic complex that she got from her father, and so she thought education would do it. And she even went to Switzerland. She studied uh, some special new kinds of education that were coming up at the end of the 19th century. And there was a method called something like uh, head, heart, hand. And I think the guy's name was uh, Pelazzosi. Uh, he was a Swiss guy who developed this. So she wanted to introduce that in Ireland and in England. So what happened to her when she was 20 in Ireland, she fell in love with this guy who was a mining engineer, and his plan was to uh, save the coal miners and the, the, the mining operation in Wales. So there was a lot of uh, very difficult working conditions. And she was paired up with this guy, ready to get married, and the guy died. So she was very disappointed, of course, and she went to England. And then she met another guy in England who had a similar vision, a little more global vision. And then this guy, he either died or he ran away. I can't remember. It wasn't clear in the books. I couldn't get what happened to that guy. But then she was totally devastated. She lost these two guys that she had really uh, connected to. So then one of her friends said, uh, don't worry, uh, somebody had just come to town and we should go over and meet him. And that was Swami Vivekananda. So she went with her friend to this uh, drawing room where he had just arrived. You know, he had gone to, he was sent by Ramakrishna to America uh, in 1893 to go to the Parliament of World Religions. And he gave such a, an inspiring and charismatic speech that he became an instant sensation in America. And he traveled all over America giving lectures. Everybody wanted to hear this famous Hindu who had come. And he was very well uh, recognized and he, uh, people really were happy with him. So he went from U.S. to U.K., so he was in England. And uh, in London, this uh, friend of Nivedita's said, we were going to see this guy. So then when she met Swami Vivekananda, she said, I mean, this is the guy. And uh, she was so taken with uh, his uh, spirit and his uh, intelligence, but she questioned him heavily. She really, uh, you know, because she was very sharp herself. So they went through a whole series of, of uh, kind of not exactly lectures, but studies and things like that. So after some time, she decided that, uh, yes, this, he was the guy. So she became not really his disciple. Uh, she joined the group that was associated with him, and she traveled with him. 
she stayed with him. And then when he was coming back here to India, uh, she said, I'm going with you. And he said, uh, it's very difficult in India. I don't know if you can, you know, with your Irish skin, it's very hot and all of that. And he tried to, I mean, he told her the realities. And she said that that doesn't matter. And uh, so she came and she came to Calcutta with him and uh, learned Bengali and started to work immediately. So her work, her first work was the education of women. And she felt that uh, that, was, that was the path toward liberation, not only of the individual, but of the nation. And what had happened to her was, of course, she was Irish, and she had a strong feeling for the Irish throwing off the British, which she thought, uh, so she was connected to the Irish Revolution, and you know that that was happening at the same time. So she had that revolutionary fervor in her, and Sri Aurobindo, you know, was in UK, in England, studying. So he was at Cambridge, and he joined this uh, secret society uh, for the liberation of India. He already started in his college days, and then he deliberately um, did not get his, uh, his uh, IAS status, his Indian Administrative Service status, because he didn't want to work for the British Empire. So he uh, deliberately failed his writing test and he didn't get his certification. And before he came back to India, he went to Ireland because there, Charles Parnell was one of the great revolutionaries uh, for the Irish and he had died, he had been killed. And Sri went to his grave and wrote a poem about that, how these great revolutionaries are kind of unrecognized. And he wrote a poem, it's kind of <clears throat> kind of nostalgic, interesting poem. And this is, and then, then he came to uh, India. And I mean, many of you know these stories, but when he came to India, he realized that he had to, you know, really, really work, but he didn't want to work for the empire and he was qualified, so he went to work for this Maharaja in Baroda. So in India at that time, you had these various states and they were not really independent of the empire, but they were not, it, really the British government wasn't kind of running in them. This Maharaja was running his place down in Baroda and he had a college, so Sri got a job there. So he's working there. So meanwhile, uh, what, what happened in, uh, uh, so I just told you that Nivedita had come to India with uh, Swami Vivekananda. So she's up in Calcutta. So she really wants to get the revolution going. So she has a plan that if she went around India and talked to all these Maharajas, they would maybe join in a secret plan to throw the British out. And she even had some ideas about bringing in some Japanese uh, mercenary soldiers to throw out the British. So she, she writes a letter to uh, the Maharaja, saying, I'm coming down, I want to meet you. So the Maharaja, he tells Sri Aurobindo, who's working for him, that this woman is coming. But Sri Aurobindo already knew about her. And he had read a book that she wrote, which is called Kali, the Mother. And he said, he wrote himself, I had read her book, Kali, the Mother, and I was enamored of that book. So he goes to the railroad station to pick her up and so, and brings her to the Maharaja. And then Sri Aurobindo also writes, uh, the, the Maharaja, he wouldn't go for anything, she said, because he was too afraid of the British. So basically the mission failed in that sense, but they met in person. So what they talked about, and uh, they had a lot of similar ideals, the, the, the interesting thing for me is that she 
of course, coming from Ireland, but who were the people, who were the, who was uh, Shurabindo's first teachers? Many of you may, may not know, they were Irish nuns. So Shurabindo, before he went to England, was in this little school up in uh, Calcutta. Yeah, the Little Sisters of Loretto or something they were called. So he got, he got that connection to Ireland from them. And these, these nuns, of course, when you, if you're ever educated by nuns, they believe in the other world. You know, they're already, uh, dedicated to a spiritual cause. And so I think I, my feeling is that some of those nuns must have influenced Shurabindo also. Okay. So then he, he goes to England, but he has this revolutionary thing. So she, their their similarities are so so incredible how their thought uh is more or less uh along similar lines Sri Aurobindo also doesn't believe in that we can put up with the british you have to throw them out you know you really uh, you really need a revolution and she had the exact same thought so they they must have uh compared notes and all of that but there is a there is a biography written by a, a French woman, Lizelle Raymond, about Sri Aurobindo and uh, Sister Nibbidi. No, he does, she doesn't mention Sri Aurobindo very much, but she puts in a dialogue in her book between the two of them. Now, I don't know if she made it up, but it's about her trying to convince um, Sri Aurobindo to come to Calcutta and get involved in, in all of these things. And uh, Sri Aurobindo, in this dialogue in her book, says, no, no, it's not time yet, but I'll be coming. So what happens is, when this uh, split happens in Bengal, he uh, he goes to Calcutta. Uh, so what we should do is go a little bit in these slides here. And you can see this, the timeline. That That was so interesting, that coincidence. Vivekananda goes to America and Sri Aurobindo comes back to India. And then in 95, 1895, uh, Margaret Noble is Sister Nivedita's uh, actual Irish name. And Nivedita means the dedicated. So this, this uh, biography written by Lizelle Raymond is called The Dedicated. So when uh, she comes, uh, to India, she becomes Sister Nivedita through the Ramakrishna mission. So uh, I think you understand that uh, Sri Ramakrishna and uh, Sarada Devi, they were very, this is a, almost a prototype of Sri Aurobindo and the mother because uh, Sarada Devi is a mother also. And she has a strong influence on all these people that is also not, uh, I don't think, very popularly known. So uh, she she takes the, you know, the whatever you want to call it, the sannyas and the brahmacharya and all that and becomes a, a nun in that order, the Ramakrishna order. Uh, and so Sri Aurobindo, though, Sri Aurobindo gets married uh, in 1901. And then uh, when... Uh, Vivek and so she is working with Vivekananda, but then soon as Vivekananda dies, she goes to Baroda. So you see how these things uh, sequentially happen. And then it's not in 1906, then he comes to Calcutta, and then he gets arrested. His first arrest was just, uh, uh, you know, that wasn't the one where he ended up in jail. That's the second arrest. So that first arrest, there was, uh, the, that case was dismissed. But the British are out to get him because of the work he's doing. And he's working with, uh, Sister Nivedita. And they're into all this publication. And she's traveling around India giving talks. And he's traveling around India giving talks. So they're, they're really into this, uh, uh, you know, changing things uh, drastically. Uh, I should go back this way. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So then, uh, 
When uh, Sri Aurobindo gets out of the Alipur jail in 1909, they start this Karma Yogin. So that's a, a weekly uh, journal, and and uh, Sri Aurobindo's working on them uh, like mad because he hasn't so much time. And Sister Nivedita is warning him he's got to get out of uh, Calcutta because the British are going to kill him because he got acquitted. So they want him uh, out of the way. And they have, uh, she knows, because Sister Nivedita also had this connection with the British elite in India. She knew all the, uh, all the top officials and she knew all the spies. And some of them actually... Uh, they never went after her because she was doing all this educational work. And somehow, and many of them supported her even, and she even got money from them for her schools. So she had, a, she, w she was very interesting how she managed all that, and she always knew what was going on. So uh, then, so Sri Aurobindo had to get down to uh, Pondicherry, and of course she had his own spiritual Adesh that you probably read about, where he, he heard, go to Pondicherry. So she arranged that. She arranged everything, and he first went uh, Chandanagar, I think, first, and then he then he left from Calcutta in the night, and she got the ticket and did all the, all the arrangements. This is uh, not sure exactly what happened or how it happened because it was all secret. Uh, and so then he's he's gone, and uh, then what happens is. Uh, she continues to finish this karma yoga and she writes all the, she does all the issues from then on, but then she is not so well, but then she starts helping this, uh, one of this, the most famous, one of the more famous, uh, Indian scientists is Dr. Chandra Bose, uh, who is having trouble with the British and having trouble with his, uh, scientific career. So she starts writing his papers and helping him. And then she gets sick and she goes to, uh, uh, Dr. Bose's house, and he and his wife take care of her, and she dies. So that's uh, 1911. So uh, in the meanwhile, uh, of course, Mirnalini is in still in Calcutta, Sri wife, and she can't get to uh, Pondicherry. Her father keeps trying to bring her because, of course, to leave from India uh, because Pondicherry was French. So she has to, he has to get a visa for her. And uh, they weren't able to get it. And finally they got it. Finally they got it in, in, in uh, 1918 uh, uh, they got it. And when she went from, she was staying I think in uh, somewhere near Calcutta, she came to Calcutta to take the trip down to Sri Aurobindo and she got the, the fever uh, they had the influenza, and she died. So all those years, she was alone there, and not really alone because she had this connection to uh, uh, Sarada Devi, who treated her, you know, in a very interesting way as a as her daughter. And uh, that whole group was all. In, and then Mirnalini was a friend of Sister Nivedita. See, so we, none of us ever knew those things. And so what, what, uh, Miralini did, she took all the jewels she got from her wedding, uh, and sold them so that Sister Nivedita's school could, uh, get some funds to do more educational work. So all these people were related in, uh, so many interesting ways that, uh, I never expected because I always thought of Sri Aurobindo as sort of a standalone, you know, hero. But there were all these people who uh, really, really supported him and uh, gave him, I think, a lot of uh, Shakti power. So, uh, so then she passed away. And then, of course, uh, 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 Sarada Devi also passes away. At the same time, the mother comes to Pondicherry. So you can see in Sri Aurobindo's life, how all of these connections are made. There's uh, these women who are supporting him in an incredible way. It's, uh, I don't know, for me, I thought it would make an incredible movie. Uh -huh. 
So now this Subramaniam uh, uh, Bharati, uh, many of you may know, he's a very, very famous in Tamil Nadu. Uh, he is a, a great poet, and he was a very close personal friend of Sri Aurobindo. When Sri Aurobindo got to Pondicherry, he, he connected to him, and so he was also a revolutionary. But who, who influenced this revolutionary, this Bharati? Sister Nivedita. She, he considered her his guru, and he wrote all this incredibly wonderful things about her. And this is a poem that he wrote about uh, Nivedita. So this is this is Bharati writing about Nivedita. So there he is. They put him on some stamps, and there she is. So look look what he said about her. So she was really a mother to him, to this uh, Dr. Chandra Bose, and she was, I don't know what the relationship between her and Sri Aurobindo was, or between her and Swami Vivekananda, but obviously it was very close and very personal. And uh, it was her uh, influence, uh, I would suspect, that helped them a lot, that helped them in their work and help them even in their thought because she she her complete works are five volumes and they have them here in the library and I went to our Oroville library and I said do you have anything on Sister Nivedita and they said no we don't have anything they looked in the catalog but we oh we do have a, a set though it's called the complete works of Sister Nivedita and they said it's in five volumes and you can only take out five books I said, well, if it's five volumes, I'll take all five, and I can take five books. So then I w I've been looking through those. Of course, I, I didn't have time to read five volumes, but you can see in, in her writings and in her thought, you know, that she's very much aligned with the, the whole spirit of Sri Aurobindo Vivekananda and all these people in such a way that I'm sure she, they mutually influenced each other. And this shows how uh, to somehow grapple with the, the oppression and the situation of, of this British, uh, you know, imperialism in India. This was a force that was able to initially get it, uh, get the people of India to wake up and... Uh, and, you know, all the boycotts that come. And, of course, Gandhi and all those people came later. Sri Aurobindo retired to do further work because he said, it's been done. Okay, we, we had the, the British Empire is finished in India. It's, it's going to go. Uh, now we have to take care of the world. So this evolution in consciousness that he had, and the other, another amazing thing is that when Sri Aurobindo had his experiences of Krishna he, in, in the jail, he also had experiences of Swami Vivekananda visiting him. Swami Vivekananda had died a few years before, but he visited, you know, in visions in the jail and told Sri Aurobindo, Sri Aurobindo writes, he told me about the supermind, he told me about, uh, you know, my work, and he said that Swami Vivekananda repeated it a second time, saying, now don't forget. So that's why he told him a second time what, what he should be doing. So you have this amazing thing. And so when he gets out of, out of the prison, I would imagine that he told Sister Nivedita, Swami Vivekananda visited me, and he told me this. And this is what we're going to do. You know, those kind of conversations must have happened. How old was the when she passed away? She was only 43. She was only 43. Yes. 1901 was definitely a disturbing era in India. So I would like to know that when Sri Aurobindo and Nivedita were working on Karma Yogi, a yes. weekly magazine, yes. what kind of a magazine was it like? I'll show you. It's right here. I have it. So it's a, a little bit funky, but uh, it's interesting. 
That's it. That's the weekly review. That's the Karma Yogin. You can see it's written there on the inside the picture. It was on religion, literature, science, philosophy. Pardon? It's written there. It was on religion, literature, science, and philosophy. Yeah, yeah. So th this movement, you see, uh, you know how Swami Vivekananda really, really put that fire into India, you know, to arise and awake. He really, uh, he really had that energy. And when he uh, came back to India, he, all these nationalists gathered around him. And so, of course, all those people met uh, Sister Nivedita because she was with him. So she got to know all those people that were in the revolutionary movement at that time. And then, of course, when she was working with Sri Aurobindo, it was the same group and probably more. So she had an overview that few people uh, had. And, and the interesting thing that she's Irish, you know, she's not an Indian. But then you have Tagore and many of the famous uh, uh, people of India writing that she was one of the most amazing persons because she was more Indian than uh, most Indians in the sense of catching the spirit of the, of the Vedic uh, message. And the, the idea of, uh, see in India you have a, they, they consider Sri Aurobindo, Vivekananda and these people to have a tantric uh, side. This is the side of action and, and things. And now there's many, I had a wonderful uh, thing that Sri Aurobindo wrote, but it's, it's got so many Sanskrit words in it that I couldn't, to give you that thread, that's your homework, is to find out the difference between the traditional Indian approach to things and the tantric approach. So the tantric approach, from what I understand, is you start out being the all Brahman. You, you start out with your total power. And with, with, with that total power, you are uh, empowered by the Shakti. And the Shakti is the divine feminine, you know, the mother. So this, this thing of the mother, the divine feminine, and somebody like Sister Nivedita who embodied that. And she could, uh, in a way, all these men that she worked with, she gave something to them that maybe they didn't have or maybe they had, but they needed her to uh, be able to express it and to do their work and to uh, do the tremendous things that they had to do and to be able to persevere against the pressure of uh, because they're in this uh, difficult situation where, you know, it's life and death. So they... Sri Aurobindo was lucky to get away with his life. And uh, Nivedita, at one point, it was like, I lost, I lost Vivekananda, but I cannot lose Sri Aurobindo. So these kind of, uh, that kind of spirit that she had, you see, is something uh, incredibly valuable that I don't know if people, uh, you know, know about or appreciate it. Just when I read it, I said, wow, this is really something, you know, that people should know this and, uh, and, and maybe understand it as much as we can. Because right now, of course, in Orville itself, we're in a crisis. And so what, how do, how do you face these things? And, uh, we, we face them, uh, using, uh, you know, our, uh, Vivekananda, there he is. So that's the, you know, the message. But in order to do that, there's a certain uh, kind of maybe understanding or realization that uh, we all need. How do you get that? So the, the mother gives you that. So this, 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 this uh, combination of the dual avatar, the male, female, and all of that, all, all of that kind of thinking and symbolism, uh, what, how does it translate into action? 
So, and we need that action today because, of course, we don't have the, the British Empire on our head. We, we have the whole corporate world on our head. We have the, what's happening in the world, the world falling apart. So it's beyond governments now because the governments, of course, are controlled by a certain uh, interest like the World Economic Forum and these kind of groups that are uh, making, uh, you know, bringing us, bringing the world down. So to understand those dynamics, so where is the Shakti now? Where is the truth? Where, where do we go? How do we handle these things? And Oroville is a little model of that. So if somehow in Oroville we get it together, because the mother, as you know, um, in 1962 said that we had to uh, build Oroville because of the impending Third World War, because the U.S. and Russia were ready to blow up the world. Not only blow it up once, but they had the firepower for 250 times blowing it up, and they had the button ready. It could have happened. And uh, I don't know, I always like to tell the story of that Russian guy. He thought that the, uh, there was a, I think he was a colonel in Russia, and uh, he's watching the radar. You know, they're watching for the missiles coming from the U.S. And suddenly the, the, the radar shows that the missiles are coming. So his job is to push the button and send the missiles back to America before they hit Russia. And he said, uh, I can't do it. He said, let us be destroyed. At least half the world gets destroyed. We don't destroy the whole world. He made that moral choice at that moment. And this is, this is a historical fact. We could have all been gone. That one guy, you know, had said, oh, yeah, I'm doing my duty. And bam, that would have been it. So that's why the mother said we need Oroville. And we, we have to have this International Center for Peace. And uh, that's why she went to Kennedy and to Khrushchev. You know, the ambassadors from India went there. And we got the okay for Oroville. And then we lost Kennedy, got shot. And we lost Khrushchev. And then they went to UNESCO, United Nations. United Nations says, no, we can't build your Oroville. We don't have the money. We don't have anything. But we will endorse Oroville and recommend every government in the world supports Oroville, and they sent that out. That's that UNESCO resolution that we have, and they do it every few years again. And they said, we'll start Oroville. So they sent 5,000 people were here in 1968 to start Oroville in the amphitheater, 5,000. And uh, as we all know, next day, they all went home. And now we're only 3,500. So we're, we're going to catch up, and then we'll be 50,000. Anyway, uh, anybody else want, want to? If anybody wants to comment and add things, see, I, my history and, and my research is very limited. And so some of you, there are people in here who know much more about this than I do. So anybody wants to comment or say yes? Pardon? I didn't. Oh, yes, yes. Well, I don't know. Right now, what happened is they were going to have that uh, conference in, uh, in Paris uh, about the 150th anniversary of, uh, of uh, Sri Aurobindo. So they were going to have all these ceremonies. But then uh, it, it, something happened in terms of the representations from Oroville were all made by the uh, Oroville Foundation and they were not representing from the community. So the community complained. And I don't know uh, how the politics went, but uh, many of those uh, things were canceled. So UNESCO at this point, I don't know. But uh, those resolutions, not every three years, I, I exaggerated. It's there maybe four or five. Five up to now, okay. Mm. 
Yeah, well, those UNESCO resolutions are there, but see, that doesn't connect to the foundation. The foundation is in a situation now where we have, you know, uh, a policy that is different than we ever had before. So the question is, how do we deal with it? And we have to deal with it in a way that uh, we realize that this is the, the pressure we're getting to grow, to progress and change. Just as uh, Sri Aurobindo said, uh, he said the British Empire coming to India helped India to grow. Do we need that kind of pressure? It seems uh, human nature in its evolutionary thing, we need some outer force to push us to move because people, of course, get into their comfort zone and uh, it's these outward things that help us. And, uh, you know, how, how do we explain how the divine is working? We really can't. But we know that everything turns to the good because that's the, the guarantee we have from our, the Vedic tradition that the victory is certain. So all the things, and that's why we follow the sunlit path. Yes. Do you think there's adequate um, language, English language primarily, but any language that is not based in like Sanskrit or Vedic um, or Tantric? I mean, I realize there's a fine line between uh, religion and um, explaining spiritual states of consciousness, but there's also a danger, it seems to me, that there's some religion element. And I'm wondering if you ever have an idea about it. Yeah, I do. I thought about that a lot because I also studied religion a lot. And uh, it, it's really a serious problem. You brought up something because the language, when you read, for example, uh, Sri, uh, well, not Sri Aurobindo so much, but Nivedita does uh, fall into this trap. She uses those words like uh, Hinduism as a religion, and then there's nationalism, uh, patriotism. All those words are loaded, you know, in, in the current uh, cultural situation. So what kind of language can we talk about to have a universal idea because religion as such uh, doesn't work you have to have but then if you say okay a uh, universal religion and but then Sri Aurobindo also wrote no no more religions the religions are finished so what do we have well he said all life is yoga so to and then when you mention yoga in most uh, contexts people are thinking you know you're doing the downward facing dog or something you know it's all hatha yoga they don't understand yoga as life and the connection to the divine so to get a spiritual language a spirituality that is not connected to religion or anti-religion is difficult really difficult. So some of the new modern writers do that. And I would say Eckhart Tolle is a master at that. So uh, Eckhart Tolle's book, A New Earth, is to me uh, a, a really a masterpiece. Be and he, at the very end of that book, he says the same thing uh, Sri Aurobindo says about, you know, we're at this crisis time and evolution. And uh, he, you know, he has, he has in himself somehow summarized all these perennial wisdoms of the ages and all of this stuff in a completely non-religious language. Of course, he's using some, uh, some people would call it new age philosophy, you know, the power of now and these kind of things, but it's, easily understandable for people who have uh, some background and some education. And there's no Sanskrit, there's no things that will, for people to trip up on. See, Sri Aurobindo is so good. I mean, The Life Divine is, is, a, is such a genius book, but so many people uh, can't read it, you know? You have to be, uh, have a certain educational background to be able to read it. Uh, and, but, What's going to happen and is happening is so many scholars and so many uh, teachers, spiritual type teachers, they read the Sri Aurobindo, they get it, and then they translate it and they water it down for everybody else. And uh, there's so many uh, 
uh, I think it was at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Sri Aurobindo, see, people have to write these uh, PhD theses. There's nothing left to write on except Sri Aurobindo because he's got new thoughts. And so the evolutionary philosophy is very attractive for PhD students. And there were, thir this was a few years ago, there were 30, 30 people at the University of Pennsylvania writing their thesis on Sri Aurobindo. So that, that to me was really uh, remarkable. So what that means though is that, you know, he's going to come into the popular culture. And Mother had said that also. After 50 years, the thought of Sri Aurobindo will, will start to, you know, really become effective in the, in the wider society. And so that 50 years has come now in 2022. We can go back and look at a couple of things. This, this is something that Sister Nivedita wrote. This is one of her uh, poems that's really nice. So you can see she really understood this thing of the mother. Mother India, but the universal mother, mother nature. You may have mentioned, B, I wasn't here at the beginning, but that um, Ireland was the first um, colony of the British Empire. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit, that, that Sri Aurobindo went there, you know, and stood on the grave of Parnell, who, uh, you know, initiated the Irish Revolution. And he so admired that guy. That was one of the reasons why I think the connection between uh, Nivedita and Sri Aurobindo was very strong. I'm embarrassed to ask this question, but for a project, another different project that I'm working on, I would like to be really clear about the salary from the Maharaja of Baroda. Well, well, you see, the, the, point, the point that they're making is that Sri Aurobindo, because he didn't get his IAS certificate, uh, he got a lower salary. And, and the Maharaja was trying for a deal. He wanted a, you know, a, a super highly trained guy for his college. And he got somebody at a little lower price. So somebody was trying to make that point. But I mean, that, that kind of detail I don't think is significant. You know, whether he got 200 rupees or 500. But Shirobindo himself said, I am getting a princely salary. And he said to Mirnalini, we have to live like the ordinary people. We cannot live in, in a luxurious style. You know, we're going to eat the simple food and we're going to live simply. And uh, we don't know what she said to that, but anyway, that, that's what he said. So he felt that he had, you know, more than he needed. And actually there are some anecdotal things in some of those people uh, that wrote about, because see, uh, Sri Aurobindo, you know, he did the evening talks, he talked to different people have put out different stories about all these things. And maybe there's a, a group of people who heard this in the, in the evening talks in the ashram, something Sri Aurobindo said, and then they, they heard one thing, somebody heard 200 rupees, somebody heard 500 rupees. I mean, these, these, the, the whole point is also that we really don't know that much about Sri Aurobindo. Because he said, my life is not on the surface for men to understand. And people wanted to always interview him and write biographies. And he said, uh, don't bother. But he wrote on himself, see? He wrote in the third person about himself. That's so nice to read if you read uh, Shirobin on himself. And he's talking about this guy who's him. It's, 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 uh, it's so... Uh, so entertaining because he, he, you know, he had an incredible sense of humor. And when you read uh, Tales of Prison Life, he's in the prison there, you know, and he wrote, writes that poem in there, Invitation, and he talks about the British Empire as giving him a free ashram life in the prison. And, and, you know, they're taking care of him. And he said he would never have stopped working and had all this time for reflection if they hadn't put him into jail. You know, he, he, and he's making jokes all along. And then he's joking about all the prosecutors. He's talking about these British uh, statesmen and these people. He's making fun of them like mad, you know. I mean, really, in a very, in a in a very cryptic and uh, subtle, and sometimes not so subtle ways. Is Nivedita a real name? Because it sounds like an Indian name. It is an Indian name. It was given to her by uh, Swami Vivekananda. 
He called her Nivedita because that means the dedicated one. And he said, this, this is a dedicated soul. So he called her Sister Nivedita. Uh, no, I can't remember. Did you say that she spent time with Sharada as well? She was uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. And, and Sarada Devi, yeah, she, they were very close, very close. That, that those people uh, up in Calcutta there, you know, that whole group, they seem to, uh, you know, really have a very strong uh, sense of community and being together. And uh, all the time, Mirnalini was, uh, she had a, she would pray every day and on her altar, she had Sri Aurobindo, of course, and she would put fresh flowers on there every day. And she had Swami Vivekananda. She had uh, Sarada Devi. So uh, when they described her little altar and her little uh, place, you got to see, and she had Kali. So this whole, this whole thing of how strong Kali was for all of them is also very interesting for people because you know people have these uh differing ideas about kali and what you know what does that mean what is that energy and that power so it was interesting that Mirnalini was had had those four things in her thing and every day because this garden where she was living uh her uncle was a botanist he worked for the agriculture and so he made this incredibly beautiful garden with all these flowers so every morning she would go out and take the flowers and she'd meditate several hours a day she was waiting to come down and join Sri Aurobindo. nine years she waited and didn't make it Okay, everybody fine? Okay, thank you all for coming, and thank you for listening to all of this. <laughs>